uh, we have a wonderful panel of uh, folks today to talk a little bit about uh, the way uh, they staff their uh, public education or government uh, centers and how we as community media centers provide services uh, with that staffing organization. Uh, there are a variety of different approaches that different community media centers must take uh, based on their size and whether they are a full service community media center offering both public education and government service uh, and channels or whether they're doing just some portion of that. And so we have uh, representative uh, folks from both large and uh, small operations and uh, we will uh, uh, introduce them uh, from my far left and then uh, they will go in the order uh, uh, down the table uh, beginning with uh, Harmony uh, from uh, Padnet. Uh, you met some, some of you met her and her staff uh, over at Padnet a couple of nights ago. She's the primary director. Padnet is a public channel only and has uh, 2.5 uh, full-time employees, if you want to call that 0.5 uh, a full-time uh, piece. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker uh, will be Stacy uh, from uh, Nalelo uh, on the island of uh, Hawaii. And uh, he is a full peg operation uh, with 17 full-time employees. And then uh, back here in uh, Southern California from uh, Pasadena, um, and George is here, and uh, he's the executive director from Pasadena Media. Uh, you've seen a number of his people uh, helping with the PA systems, and they'll be broadcasting the wave reports tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll take uh, do some presentation stuff, and then take questions at the end. Uh, my name is Gary Martin, and I'm the executive director at Access Sacramento. And uh, because I'm on the ACM West board, we're part of the conference planning and to facilitate this particular uh, panel discussion. So I will, we'll begin with uh, Harmony. And uh, Harmony, thank you for all the work from Padnet in uh, managing this conference. Yeah, thank, thank you, Gary, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm from Padnet. That stands for Public Access Digital Network. And um, even though we're here talking about staffing, I just want to give a tiny bit of backstory because I think it helps you understand our media center structure and why we staff the way that we do. Because compared to most media centers, we're, you, we're in a unique situation because PADNET is operated by a larger um, organization, Long Beach Community Action Partnership, or LBCAP. And PADNET is just one of four programs that is offered by LBCAP. And although these four programs um, provide different services, such as energy assistance, tax assistance, youth services, and community media, we all support LBCAP's mission to provide dynamic pathways to self-sustainability for low-income individuals and families through advocacy, education, and energy assistance. I want to quickly circle back to our youth services. Our LAMP program um, is, um, teaches low-income youth leadership through the arts, um, creative disciplines taught our photo, um, photography, music production, graphic design and silk screening, and film and television production. So that plays a big part of the creation of Padnet. So a bit of history. Um, after 2006, over 50 access stations, um, including Long Beach, were closed because California passed an act called Div DIVCA, which disallowed operational expenses. Luckily, the city of Long Beach saw the, um, the value in providing the, commu the community with locally produced news, information, and entertainment. So they set out to relaunch public access in the city. Um, however, they needed an agency to take on um, the operational costs and manage the daily responsibilities. So in 2011, LBCAP submitted a proposal to take over the operation of Long Beach Access. And in the following year, that contract was awarded to LBCAP, and in August of 2012, Long Beach Public Access was back on the air. And I believe Padnet was the first one to come back from all those channels. So, uh, so the reason that we're all here to talk about staffing, so my position is the program and production manager, and I report to the COO of LBCAP. And um, I basically oversee the program at our media center, as well as I supervise all, um, all in-house client productions, 
and uh, all in-house and client productions and manage program staff, freelancers, and interns. I manage our full-time equipment and channel coordinator, um, whose responsibilities include managing the equipment, edit suites and studio, um, as well as coordinate video submissions and playback. And I also manage a part-time membership services assistant um, who helps um, take care of the me uh, memberships, schedule media training, and assist with the reservations of our equipment, edit suites, and um, studio. So the two of them handle um, all of the day-to-day, -day, and our team of 2.5 um, is Panet's core team, and for those of you who were at the open house the other night, um, Derek Simpson, he says that we're small but mighty, um, but, um, but that's basically who we are, right there. Um, our, overall our overall operations budget is um, a little over $300,000, um, and the third of that budget is generated from program income. Our program also requires additional support from seasonal staff, freelance instructors, and production crew. Um, I only use them when we have raised additional funds in classes and in production services. For example, um, we, we have our media training classes. They cost roughly between $45 and $100, depending on the class. And if we have three or more students enrolled in the class, then we're able to pay for an instructor to come teach the class. But if we have less than three, we cancel the class, and then we don't need the instructor to teach. Um, same for our production services. Um, we, I, I generate a quote of our, um, for the production based on the amount of production crew that we use, as well as the amount of time that I need that crew for just to ensure that I have enough funds to cover hiring um, freelance crew. Um, we also utilize volunteers who are typically PADMET members who are just looking for additional hands-on experience. And, um, and if there's anything you can take away from what I, my presentation, it's, um, it's the fact that we use a lot of interns and highly suggest that um, Interns are a great um, resource for your media centers. Um, our interns are unpaid. Oh, sorry. Our interns are unpaid, but we do make sure that they earn school credit. And um, on average, we do receive about 50 applications a semester. Just this past semester, we received um, a close to 70 applications. And they, they apply for the internship as if they're applying for a job. So um, I, I find those applications, I select the ones that I, I would like to know more about, I pass it along to our HR generalist. She conducts a phone screening of those selected applicants. Um, from there, we decide who to narrow it down to to bring in for an in-person interview. And then again, we narrow it down on who to select for the semester. Um, this semester, we offer the internship to seven college students, same with last semester, and um, we, we've created a lot of buzz at the nearby colleges, especially Cal State Long Beach, and uh, we, we, we often receive applications from interns who had a friend who previously interned with us and highly recommended our internship, and uh, so it's very, it's good to hear that word is spreading around the college campuses. Um, they, they get hands-on experience with every aspect of production. I'm going to show off some photos of our interns here. Uh, they can help out in the studio, as, as helping out operating the teleprompter, setting up the lights, setting up audio, camera operators. We have a show called Long Beach Lens that we film every month in the studio. It's Padnet's flagship show where we um, we interview uh, leaders in the community. Uh, we, we also work with our interns in the field. Uh, they do a, um, we do a series called Long Beach Shorts where our interns get to produce, film, and edit the, these videos entirely. And, um, and we just kind of mentor them through that process. And, um, and then we 
have, we, we have them creating short promos for us. We'll need promos to promote our media center, promos to promote our classes. Um, we like to do little behind the scenes videos whenever our members are um, working in the um, studio. Um, and, and we also, um, recently I started encouraging them to create um, vlogs of their experience as interns. Uh, I wish I could show a, a clip of that later. In the summertime, we've worked with students who come in from out of state um, because they have that um, ability to be away from wherever their um, college is located. This past summer, I had a student from Columbia College of Chicago. Um, another summer, we had someone from Northwestern University. Uh, another summer, we had someone from Cornell University. And, um, and Gary, just this past summer, we had a student from Sacramento State and we told him all about Sac Access Sacramento, and, um, and he recently reached out to me and I reminded him about Access Sacramento, and he might be sending an email. And he's applied in the last two weeks uh, to be an intern with us. Oh, he has? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we highly encourage our interns. Um, and then at the, at the end of the semester, um, we, uh, yeah, and there's Vincent right there in the center bottom. Haven't met him yet. Okay, I think he's on the stage. Okay. okay. At the end of the semester, we celebrate our interns by taking them out to lunch, um, give them further advice on how to how to move forward with their career, and um, and I would say a lot of our past interns have been called, um, have been hired as staff. Our um, our current membership services assistant, past intern, our previous membership assistant, membership services assistant. Also, a past intern. We've had um, um, we brought in some freelancers and seasonal um, and seasonal staff that have also been past interns. We hired one as an instructor for our, our youth program, LAMP, to teach the film and TV. And um, and many of our interns stick around to continue to use our resources as members which is very nice to see. I have interns from two years ago, three years ago, that still come in and use the studio, which is nice to see. And um, we do offer them our free membership as an intern, and then if they, when that membership runs out, they choose to renew it. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that. And um, we recently had an intern that was hired by Pasadena Media. Yay! And um, we have a, an intern that currently works for Sony, a past intern that works on the Paramount Studios lot, um, and, a, and another one that works for the Dr. Phil show. So we're very proud of what our interns have done. This is one of my favorite, favorite photos of them because at the beginning of the semester, they're usually very shy and quiet, and at the end of the experience, at the end of the semester, they're, they're BFFs. They miss each other at the end. Um, I want to end this presentation with a video. I don't, I don't have time to show the entire video because it's five minutes long, but I, I hope I have time for two more minutes. Okay, so just to give context, because I am starting in the middle of this video, um, I, I, I started asking the interns to record vlogs of their experience, and so these two interns um, started talking about a project that they did earlier that semester, so. I just lost the cue time, so let me see if I can cue it back up.
friends, you can like contact them. You know, it's all about networking. Like, it's just a plus. I am good at this. Like, like you said, networking. That's huge. If you network with people like, and you get to know them a little more, like, you can give them a call and they'll help you out. Like, they'll give you a recommendation letter. And I know for sure I want one from Harmony. Yeah, I know. I had a great time here at Patton. I learned more about myself. I made new friends. They seriously care about you so much. They want you to succeed. They want you to do better. We as interns, we want to do great things in the film industry. And this is how we're doing it now. We're doing what Patton. Patton is going to be in here with the memories along with this. I'm always going to remember this place, Patton. We're Patton. Basically, where it all started, right? Yeah, dude. Like where it all started. started. Ladies and gentlemen, very good. Thank you for taking the training. Thank you to Harmony. I have one question, and I'm not going to put you on spot on numbers, but in general terms, with your two and a half people, approximately how many members do you have to provide service to, or how many videos do you support a month that come from the public? Right. Um, I know um, in our member database, it's sitting at about 150. And, um, and I know that since of April of, of last year, we have um, received over 200 hours of content. So in uh, approximately the last seven months, uh, 200 programs. Um, yeah, we're doing the math right. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's just in, pers in perspective to your, uh, to your own center. Um, it, I, I was delighted to hear that you have um, a, a variety of interns that come in, and as Stacy gets set up, I'll just compliment the fact that Long Beach State, uh, here locally, along with uh, Chapman and Loyola Marymount, uh, two private colleges, probably have the best uh, video production training programs uh, in the area. Um, film, uh, you have to go to UCLA and USC uh, to get that kind of quality. Uh, but uh, Chapman, Long Beach State, and uh, Loyola Marymount are probably your best video schools. Uh, so uh, compliments on being connected uh, with two within about 20 miles of here. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Stacy, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm just doing these days. Okay. So uh, Stacy is, uh, again, from uh, the big island of Hawaii. Uh, he's a full peg operation and uh, has uh, 17 full-time uh, staff members. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, you know, I have said some people learn from me two and a half people, but also you do. Well, I feel kind of loaded with 17 employees now. <laughs> um, again, a lot of good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stacy Higa. I'm the president and CEO of Valeo TV. Uh, I want to give you guys a quick uh, intro about us. You know, well, I'm going to do a disclaimer. Four years ago, uh, when I first started working at Valeo, uh, we had absolutely no volunteer program. So I looked at that as sort of like a blessing because I had I wasn't going to upset anybody by coming in and trying to change. So I, I looked at it like I had a clean slate to develop a uh, volunteer program. Um, my talk is I could go into great detail about all the things we do on the operational side, but I'm focusing today basically how we utilize the volunteers. Um, so about us, Nala TV is the PEG provider for the county of Hawaii. Hawaii Island is the largest geographical county um, with over 4,023 square miles and a population, give or take, approximately 195,000 residents. The landmass, just so you understand how, how big this landmass is, the landmass um, basically can fit, all the other Hawaiian islands can fit into the landmass size of our island. So you can see I have a lot of uh, geographic challenges on it. On the big island. Um, let's see here. That's what the island looks like. In three, and this island is still growing, as you saw last May. You know, we have no uh, volcanic activity right now, but this island actually grew, uh, I think, five, six hundred uh, square miles of water. So it's still growing, but luckily it's kind of stopped growing right now. Uh, I have a full time staff of 17 employees, 14 located in the Hilo area, and three located in the, in the Kona Media Center. Um, all of our staff is cross-trained uh, to multiple jobs, and the reason for that is that you know I have uh, redundancy and uh, continuity in, in every position within our organization. Um, let's see. So I'm going to 
the guys are going to lose ratings pretty bad. Um, you know, so by cross training everybody, this, this provides opportunities for staff to get promoted within. Um, they have to learn each other's jobs so that I really look interior before I uh, go out and find exterior people to come in. I give all the current staff an opportunity to move up and, and be mobile in our, in our company. Uh, as an example of this, uh, we have our receptionist uh, trained. She actually uh, is working client services, and then what she does is she doubles as a camera person, she doubles as a uh, lower thirds person on, on some of our uh, knowledge TV programs. And then we also have people like our Gina Jobs here and Matt and Micah. They're, uh, Gina is uh, training to be an on-air personality, and so is uh, Micah. Oops, sorry. I'm a math guy, I don't know how to do So there you go, so we cross train our staffs, so et cetera. Um, one of our programs that we've had is, yeah. our high school program. We have a high school program that's multi-pronged. Uh, what we do is we work with uh, local high schools and we actually teach our, our kids, so that the students to come in and work side by side with our staff on a lot of our NLTV um, projects and programs. And the result of this has been very, very successful. We've actually started the first couple of years only with juniors and seniors. We've had good success that now we're opening up all high school um, students. And as an example, we did a high school graduation, and the high school graduation ended up with um, the juniors basically running the graduation. They ended up working on the start time, working on where the students, uh, the graduates are going to stand, where they're going to exit so that they get the, the perfect shots. So the, the junior class was actually very, very heavily involved, and it set the, the stage for the next year uh, when they become graduates, they're training the next group to come in. So it also helped us because it forces the high school to use us over and over again because we have this continuity that's going with, with, the, with the students. We also have our, our number of volunteer program, which this program is basically set up for our external producers who come in, and we entice them with the opportunity to learn uh, how to use some of the higher, higher tech equipment. And so they have to volunteer, work with us, and then once they complete our, our in-house classes for the volunteer program, they can check out some of our higher end equipment, the larger cameras, the, you know, the better mics, all, all the great toys that we have for ourselves. We end up letting them use that. Um, then the last one we have uh, the volunteer program is our professional volunteer program. This one is a very interesting one. This is, um, comes either you have to be highly recommended or you have to have a resume that's in the in the field. And through this program, uh, we had some great successes. Like uh, this this girl right there, Shelby Hota. She was uh, working at a well-paid job in LA doing uh, video editing. Uh, she moved back to Hawaii, couldn't find a job in, you know, that paid similar to what, what she was earning in LA. And she's now running a, she's general manager of a fitness program, but she's so, so passionate about the field that she came to volunteer. So what we've done is we use her uh, on call, and she, anything we need to do, she's an excellent, excellent um, editor, uh, camera person, the, the whole nine yards, she can do it all. And she's part of our volunteer program. Uh, my highlight one is, okay, very cool, is Matt Cordero. Matt, about two years ago, volunteered on, a, on one of our political programs that we're showcasing our election night coverage. He volunteered on that and it extended for four or five hours. I was so impressed with him that I asked him, hey, would you like to uh, uh, possibly work here? And he said, absolutely. So he came through the door. And he ended up um, working on hiring as a production specialist. He's such an innovative and great talent that a short seven months later, I promoted him to he's now my um, production manager. I mean, so you want to talk about a success story, a guy that didn't go to college, but he was so passionate through his high school career that he was involved in the, the video program at his local high school, that he ended up working for um, a, a wedding company that you know, shoots wedding videos and things like that. Came and volunteered, and now he's got a career with me as a, a full-time production manager. So he's he's a great success story and an example. So even today, I, 
Um, he's out at with the, one of my marketing managers doing a high school career fair back in, in Hilo as we speak today as well. Right about now, 9 o'clock to white time. Um, next person I have is this phone. Get this little man. Then the other person I have is um, let me go school. Okay. Uh, Naya Kaupua. He was a guy that's uh, a great singing talent and actually came in just to use our studios to promote one of his um, uh, work on a, a video for a, a, a song video. Like what he saw, started volunteering, the next thing you know, he's a hired as a production specialist. And then we find out that not only can he sing, but he's actually a very, very good uh, editor. So now he's sort of become, in a short three months, my uh, supervising editor in charge of all our edits at Lalo TV. Okay. Uh, to the volunteer program, we also use the cross training, we use our on air talents. A lot of my employees are cross trained as uh, either host uh, or on air talent. As you see in the middle here, uh, or this, this slide right here, Audrey Wilson does a cooking show. She's actually a, a local columnist in the, in the local paper. So she has a column that she does cooking in the, in the paper, and then we bring her into the studio. She does a cooking show monthly for us that sort of like connects the, the print and the, uh, the our media field. And then J.E., who's in here with her, with her, had 15 years as a, a DJ and broadcaster of local radio station. So I brought him in, now he's in charge of my client services, and he's also one of our honor, uh, in house talents. And then lastly, this is pictures of some of our volunteers that are out there that are, are part, of, part of our external producers program. You know, and in summary, I just want to, I cannot emphasize how important um, the volunteer program is for our company. Because, like I said, um, four years ago, I, we had no volunteers. Now we probably have anywhere from, if I talk to children, uh, the students, probably between eight to 20 volunteers that I can call upon to actually come in and help us on any of our projects. But I really use this as a tool to figure out um, uh, with, with the volunteers, work habits, you know, what people, their, their skill levels, and it's just basically a way to showcase their talent in case they want to become um, a future employee of our, our company. And the other thing is, through our networks, we, we highly uh, recommend um, our volunteers. If, if we can't hire them, we will always uh, use me as a, as a reference. I will highly recommend them to any one of our, our uh, fellow pay um, stations that are out there. So uh, again, that's real simple in a, in a nutshell what we do on the Big Island, uh, utilizing our volunteers. And later on, if you want to get in depth about some of our other staff, I can talk about that. Sure. Uh, Stacy, you talked uh, primarily about education. Um, you're a full peg, though. Do you have city council meetings and uh, you have supervisors and such? How do you staff those? So it's, it's kind of interesting. On our island, the, the city council, council council is actually our <coughs> number one program. So we have a channel dedicated to that. Um, we're currently not the provider of that. What happens is the county video uh, takes it themselves and then gives it to us. But we're in the process of negotiating and taking that away because what's happened was they don't have the ability to go live, but they got to stream it. Um, and then the replay because it has to be ingested into our system takes, takes a while. So now I'm trying to uh, enhance that by saying, hey, if you guys use us, we'll do it live, we'll stream it on our website, and I guarantee you, we'll, our first replay will be tonight at, at 6 p.m., you know, so that's sort of like how we're looking at uh, hopefully getting that contract moving forward. In many peg operations, the government piece is huge in terms of staffing because you simply have to have people to operate that Correct. equipment. So slightly different because you're just building it. Really. But, but again, I, but I'm looking at, at that, um, I have a template that even for us, if we had to go in and, and get that contract, we'd probably just divert some of my staff. We, we'd probably dedicate uh, one and a half or two people on a full-time basis to be able to cover the, um, the local county council. Right. Stacy, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to, uh, to Pasadena and uh, George. Uh, Pasadena hosted the national uh, ACM uh, conference, I, was it in 2013 or 14, 2000? 14, yeah. and, uh, uh, and since then, uh, George has taken on the, the role of uh, executive, uh, uh, executive director. And it's, um, uh, 
I, I first met him several years ago and was very impressed with his Hollywood background. Uh, so Pasadena gets a lot of, uh, of benefits out of, out of that. And uh, George, I think you said that uh, you have how many? Ten? Uh, we, we have ten full time. Ten full time, uh, uh, and it's a full PAG operations public yes. education yes. government. George, thank you. Well, thanks, Gary. I, uh, I feel a little remiss that I don't have such a great presentation. I thought, I thought those two presentations were outstanding myself. Um, uh, yes, I'll give you a little bit of background. I, I come from the television business, the, the, uh, the production business. I worked at NBC for almost uh, 26 years or so um, and had multiple jobs there, um, leaving there as vice president of the West Coast and then took on another job uh, in Pasadena where I was uh, handling uh, the real estate investments for a design school. Uh, but during that time, uh, I had the opportunity to get involved with uh, Pasadena Media. It's actually called uh, Pasadena Community Access Corporation. And some of the functionalities that you talk about are very similar to us. In fact, um, they're almost identical in some ways. So if I sound like I'm replicating or parroting what you said, I apologize. Um, but I was, the, uh, I was on the board, asked to join the board of PCAC, and then eventually became the chairman of the board. Um, our structure's a little bit different. Um, so it's Pasadena Community Access Corporation is officially what we are. Uh, we're one of the three operating companies in the city of Pasadena. So the most important, perhaps, to the city, you know, the one that most people uh, are familiar with, is the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl operating company is an entity to itself, um, uh, uh, managed by Daryl Dunn. Um, then we have the convention center, which is managed by Mike Ross. And then there's us. And I can give you a little uh, a flavor of where we are in terms of the money. Daryl's budget is, I'd say, roughly $60 million, $65 million. Um, it takes much of that money, even with all the programs that he puts on at the Rose Bowl, he still only invests maybe $50,000, $60,000 at the end of the year. Uh, very expensive run the Rose Bowl. The, Mike, uh, the convention center is roughly $43 million. Uh, they get funding uh, from the hotel taxes and other things to operate the convention center. Of course, they charge for the convention center. And then there's PCAC, us, and our budget's a little less than a million dollars. Um, difficult because we don't generate a revenue in some cases. Y yes, like you, we, we rent our facilities and, and uh, uh, we do our best with what I refer to it as telesales. Um, but let me give you a breakdown of where we are. Located in Pasadena, if you, if you just hit that little button for me there, I'll give you a little flavor of what we look like. Uh, yes. yes. Um, we, uh, I, as, uh, um, I invite you all to come by and see us. Um, this is the sort of the of So there are four stations, as I indicated. Actually, I love this video that they put, so I watch it. Uh, 
Uh, and in addition to uh, the city council meetings, uh, uh, we also provide a host of programming for the government chair. Uh, Bobby Ferguson is here with me today and helping with this conference uh, is the head uh, of production for us. And I'm so pleased, and you actually work together, so you know each other right now. Um, I'm so pleased that I had the opportunity to work with her because I think we've made a good change within the city by develop, developing programming for the government chair. These are shows like Impact uh, Pasadena, which we do interviews with local elected officials. Um, and then um, we, we started a new magazine variety show called uh, What's Up Pasadena. And you saw pieces of there that Bobby hosts and produces. And it shows and gives the flavor of what the city of Pasadena is all about. And it's a challenge for her because, you know, every, every month as she's doing her show, we're, we're looking for new venues and not to be redundant. Um, the government channel is an important channel because it also talks about disaster preparedness, police issues, fire issues, and other things. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for the departments to share their, their ideas and their services throughout the community. And Bobby's done an outstanding job in putting those two together. So she'll work with the Department of Transportation, the Department of Human Services, and we do PSAs for them on a regular basis. It's programming for them. It saves them money within the city and also helps utilize our staff. The Arroyo Channel uh, is, is our channel, our studio that we give uh, to, the, to the public. It's, if you look at our website, we, we believe strongly in, in television for the people and by the people. You know, I don't, I don't want to take this to a, a larger conversation, but it's a difficult time for public television right now. It's a difficult time, uh, as, as uh, Mike was indicating in the meeting before us, I'm going to try to get to Washington in March. Um, People are having a different look at what we do. And you know, I come from commercial television. And, and I know that my colleagues at commercial television uh, that are making a lot of money are struggling as well because they're, they're losing viewership. It's so fragmented. Um, to give an example, the Netflix is becoming one of the dominant uh, sources uh, for product today. And who would have ever thought that six years ago? I, I bring that to your attention because the mayor and city council consistently ask me, uh, what, what are your ratings? That's, that's what that's I want. How many people watch your show? How can we, how can you, how can you put metrics to what you do? How can we justify giving you money versus hiring a fireman or, or, or a policeman? I have these discussions with uh, city officials uh, on a regular basis, sometimes a little tense. Um, I'm fortunate that um, at, at the stage of my career, you know, I, I, I took this job specifically because I truly believe in television for the people by the people. I truly believe uh, in television that the community have a pure voice. I truly believe that it's with a city as rich and as, and as lucky as Pasadena, that it's our responsibility to provide that uh, avenue for their voice. Um, and that gets hard to do. Uh, recently, uh, to give you a little bit of a structure, we just passed a sales tax uh, in the city of Pasadena that will it'll generate roughly 21, 22 million. I think it might make it 22 and a half million dollars next year. We'll split that in three ways. Uh, a third of that will go to the public school system. That digress for a second. The public school system in Pasadena struggles. Half of all the kids in Pasadena go to private school. We have the most outstanding private schools in the country, but they're very, very expensive. Uh, we're, we're in the struggle right now of a community in Pasadena where is it is a city full of wealthy people yeah. and, and the people that support the city have to live outside the city or is this a city that's really diverse and a full community? Of course, we take the position we think the city should be a full city and diverse. Diverse in our staffing and diverse in how we do our broadcasting. Anyway, uh, getting back to the breakdown of the station. So there's the, uh, there's the government channel. There's the Arroyo Channel. Uh, there's a channel for PUSD, public, the Public Unified School District. And then there's a channel for the college, Pasadena City College. Each of each, each, the college and the high schools have their own facilities. Pretty great facilities. They just spent about a million and a half dollars on a new studio uh, at a high school in, in Pasadena. And PCC has a, a wonderful facility for their students. But what I find is, is that as they, as they matriculate through this process, 
what, what students actually don't understand or get, even at some of the better schools, even at, 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 at SC, at my alma mater, at other places, um, you, you don't really get the hands-on experience as to what it's like to be in the environment. And you provide that. You provide that every day. We provide that every day. Um, it may be something as setting a remote crew out there volunteers with our regular staff to do a, uh, an interview on the street or cover a news conference of some kind or a special event like the Rose Bowl. But it's hard for volunteers to really get that kind of experience. And that's what we are all good at. I think that's also what I, I remind the city of, is that it's not just people who come in as volunteers. These, you know, you got amazing stories where people come in and you change their lives through their volunteerism. You know, people want to get into the broadcast business and try to understand what it is. And it's very difficult to get a job in television. I mean, for all of you. You know, I'm fortunate to have an outstanding, incredible, amazing staff, award-winning staff. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate that these employees that we have want to be here because we're community-based. I mean, I, 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 I'm not embarrassing her. She, she could take a job in, in, uh, in, in the broadcast world without a doubt and make double the money that I pay. But she, she and the chief operations officer, that Chris Miller, some of you might have met him, they're, they're totally committed to public access television and television for the people and by the people. I, I remind you that if you take a look at our website, we promote that, we talk about it. So there's the four channels, and how does it work? Pretty similar as they describe their stations. We rely you know, heavily on three components. I changed a little bit. I was chairman of the board five or six years ago and I actually did the conference and carry was the um, and then I retired from the last job and came to Pasadena Media because I, I just wanted to be with them, to work with them. I mean, this is such an exciting place to go to every day, I can't tell you. Every day you walk into that door and there's something new and exciting. We too are blessed with interns from all over Southern California. Um, uh, we probably, Bobby takes in probably three, four interns uh, a, a, a semester. They too get credits. They are outstanding. I give you a, a little description of a young uh, lady that came in and was in her last intern. Not only did she do an internship for us, worked on all the shows, learned camera work, editing, directing, but before she left, she did a presentation to us to how to do a locally based news broadcast. It, it, I, I was completely blown away. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that this young woman's going to be working at CNN within two years. Um, but it's, it's that kind of relationship that we get with the interns. And then we also come up with the volunteers. You know, the volunteers are huge for us. So let me go back for a second. PCAC, Pasadena Media, which is what we refer ourselves as, um, has been in existence for 35 years. It started, I remember when it started, uh, in Pasadena. Uh, the then uh, may, uh, uh, city council, we didn't have, a, we didn't have an elected mayor at the time. Uh, in the northwest part of Pasadena, they had a problem with youth. They were trying to figure out what, what can we do to get the youth off the street and get them occupied after school. So they, they came up with this program. And I think within about a year, they decided to buy some television equipment. Not great equipment, not a great location. But, but it evolved from there into this, this after-school training program to what it is today, you know, a professional uh, television facility with volunteers uh, for the government and for the Arroyo channels. Um, but what's fascinating about this is that some of the people that actually work for us today have been with us for 10, 12, 15 years, started as young volunteers, started working their way through uh, Pasadena Media and learning all of the different kinds of jobs. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll jump over and talk about money for a minute because that's what I focus on most of the time. We have an amazing staff, and I'll, I'll, again, it's broken down into three categories. Aaron Wheeler, who's here at the conference, has been here at the conference. He's the head of community. Uh, Bobby Ferguson is the head of production, and Chris Miller is our chief operations officer. He was here uh, just a little while ago. I found it easier to break the house up in these three components and categories. Um, the technical operations side is without question. We all, we all have to deal with that in our capacity in broadcasting. It's, it's a given. 
and uh, we're always struggling with our our our, our giver, our provider is uh, is uh, is, uh, is is AT and T, which isn't always that great, and of course Charter, which uh, or, or Spectrum, as they're called, and we have our struggles with it. We want high definition signals. We believe we're entitled to high definition. I think you're all entitled to high definition mm -hmm. systems, but your provider won't do that for you. So we're, we're actively participating, and, and I got the mayor and city council to kind of push it. Uh, Chris Holden, who here in California, uh, Assembly uh, Speaker Holden, I've asked him to, to take on the measure. I've asked you to think about this. Uh, it, it's, you know, uh, as I, you know, I started my career as a young camera, Emmy Award one camera. When I see the pictures that my people create and put out, not, not just the staff, but the volunteers and, and other people that come in and do the shows, and then to see them broadcast out and, and, and the degradation of the picture infuriates me, and, and it does our viewers. Um, so that, that's a big issue for us. And, and by breaking down the three areas uh, in the technical operations, uh, production, uh, Bobby Ferguson in production really does our telesales. Our telesales is renting our facilities. Um, renting your facilities is kind of hard to do because we, we, we're, in, we're in Hollywood, and the competition in Hollywood for rental facilities is pretty high. They want to leave their set standing. They don't want to use your crew. They come in with unions. Our stage is very small compared to the kind of stages they need. But we do rent our facilities. Uh, last year, Bobby was fairly successful in several big shows that, that we did where they come in and uh, we garner thousands of dollars by renting our crew, our facilities, helping pull the sets, et cetera. On the government side, I mentioned to you, building their capacity is, is really important to us. We found that the programming uh, was just stale, repetitive. They'd run shows, they'd run the Rose Bowl, for the Rose Parade, for example, you know, for seven months. After. And we, we tried to build a relationship with the term, actually, we have built a relationship the roses, so that we're now more timely. We, we do the parade and we cover the parade in a different way. At the end of the parade, we saw a piece of that. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the community side, Aaron Wheeler, I challenge him to go out into the community and find these volunteers. He has a whole set of different interns. Uh, they might be high school students, for example, uh, or, or nonprofits within the community of Los Angeles where we bring in interns. Bobby will tell you I'm a stickler with interns that, that if they're here, I want them to learn and work. Uh, we're, even though they get credit, and even though we're not paying them, I still expect a lot from the interns. You know, we're, they're, they're using our facilities and our time and our knowledge. Um, and I want them to get something out of that when they leave. And, 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 and I'm assured by the department heads, which Bobby is one, that that happens. Um, George, yes. as, a, as a paid cooperation, yes. let me yes. ask the, the same question sure. that I asked the, the other two. How do you cover government meetings? Uh, paid staff? We or do you pay staff? Okay. Some, sometimes volunteers. We use, sometimes we use some of But it's usually paid staff all, all the time. City council all the time. Yeah. Okay. And um, in your public operation, approximately how many members do you manage? And, and about how many programs a month maybe do you So let me break that in three ways. Um, we, we estimate that in a year, about 500 people walk through our door. That's, you know, that's how I calculate. How do I know what's going on in my business? I need to, you know, metrics is a big deal for the business today that we're in, for all of us. Uh, some of us are more fortunate where the municipalities you get your money from, they may not challenge you that way, but in our case, uh, it's, it's very clear. Um, we probably have maybe 30, 40 active producers. I would say about 55 very active producers, yeah. and then probably somewhere around 150 to 200 volunteers or associated crew right. between either specific shows or they kind of range around and actually assist us as well. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a flux uh, in terms of looking at how people provide both member services and their production uh, capability uh, and reaching out to both public education and government. So depending on what your service base is and how many channels you have to feed, you obviously have to uh, structure your, uh, your setups in a, in a variety of different ways. Um, have you gone through major restructuring in recent years because of the change or the anticipated change in finances? Or is this uh, something that's been relatively stable for you for a while? 
I did. I, uh, you know, I've been there now over two years. Uh, the first thing I had to do was reduce their operating costs. Uh, they had beautiful, they had beautiful. I mean, I encourage you guys to come see us in Pasadena.
clear that interns and volunteers are a pathway towards staffing support. However, um, work for government, we have a lot of union issues, um, but also laws regarding internships when they offset paid staff. How do you guys address that issue? For me, for me, I, I roll it into an educational program. Yeah. And then, because it's an educational program, and we structure it that way, we kind of, the, the unions and other people won't kind of grumble about that. You know, it's, it's a green line, but I, I roll it into an educational uh, train job, chair, job training type of uh, mm -hmm. enterprise, and it kind of squelches that. that uh, you see job training, are you involving other public agencies that are built for creating job you know the university uh, working in fact because i just as i came here yesterday i got a phone call from our local university wanting to connect up with us and, and create more of an internship uh, with their with their university uh harley had that you as interns I mean, yeah uh, same thing i mean our our interns don't replace staff and we, when we're in between semesters we just like yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly yeah. i'm curious when you say unions so you're going to union where are you? Contra Costa County. Contra Costa. So we're a government facility. We're not a government employee. Okay. And then the union that represents you is uh, the government. That's the idea. Well, it's local 21. It's a professional type of engineers. Okay. I guess, you know, I, I, I had experience with unions, and, and uh, I was a union member and a shop steward and all that you know, three or four years ago. We, we couldn't afford to be. Um, the, yeah. if, if, if my employees became unionized, it, I think we did break the bank. Um, I'm all for unions. I think they're great, and uh, I think that they they, uh, they they're good for employees and they're good for employers. However, in our in our business and most of your businesses, uh, that that would be a real uh, game changer. And, and then I'll finish by saying the interns that Bobby brings in and Aaron brings in, no, they don't get paid. And just 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 like you, there's no combination between the two. They they support our existing staff. They're volunteering to get no money, so they're not on the payroll. So if they weren't there, that work just wouldn't get done. Uh, if they, if, if the interns weren't there, a couple of other ways we could do it. We use our existing staff, and Bobby has an on-call staff of freelancers that we call in, and if I, should I make the decision, right? Uh, I can actually speak to that. Any interns, really, they are just there to assist us, but they're never by themselves. I never send them out to do anything really by themselves if they're not supported by an actual book. Everything that they're doing, they're actually learning because I know within labor laws and really between all the internships um, through schools, it, they must be learning because yes, they cannot replace your actual staff. And so, no, they're always just supporting and they're always learning kind of directly from uh, one of our key members. No, I'm just so, going to say state law, I can enroll for the replacement. The state of California would be very careful about part-time versus I suspect each state has its own wall. Um, uh, in, in our case, if you're, it's, it's, I think it's 36 hours, it's 33, 33 hours or less for a part-time employee. So 30, 32 hours or less. And we, we're pretty strict about that because the state of California will find you and, 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 and a lot of employees, especially in our business of broadcasting, television, film, they like to bring in part-time employees. They like to keep them for a long, long time and never make them full-time and pay them benefits. And it's a good thing for the employer, bad thing for the employee. So we're, we're pretty strict about that. State of California, 32 hours, trigger benefits. Right, trigger yeah. yeah. benefits. I will only comment uh, out of Access Sacramento, a, a labeling thing. Uh, we don't have volunteers. We have members and we have interns. Uh, but we, in order for them to be covered by insurance, uh, we they, they pay a thirty dollar membership fee annually, and they then are covered by our insurance. And that's just the way we kind of handle it. We don't allow people to walk in off the street. We're a training organization, and if you want to learn on our equipment, become a member, and then take a certification class, and then use our studio free. Uh, but uh, we don't label people volunteers. Uh, they are members, and then they are in service to each other and to to us. Uh, but it, it allows it to, to be a little clearer on the insurance and the risk liability uh, yeah. members. That, and then we have interns. And, 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 and as it turns out, say interns have to be getting college credit. You can't, it's pretty tough for us to have a high school intern because not many high schools have internship programs where they get credit for being on your job site. And so in order for OSHA to cover them, uh, they're in a college class, 
the workers' comp covers them from the college when they are on our site. So we have very specific relationships between our colleges and the programs that give us interns. Our, our situation is the same as um, the, 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 the membership that we call them. We have members. We call them producer members. They pay a fee of $50 every six months. Uh, that also covers us with the insurance. Uh, so when we talk about volunteers, they, they at a very minimum have to be of that ilk. They, they, right. Again, they just can't come on off the street. Uh, we do have high school students, though, and I, I will just share with you, if, if you get into that arena, which uh, Bobby and I and Chris did and Aaron, uh, it's, a little, it's a little unique because you got, these are minors and they're in your facility. And you know, you can imagine all the laws and regulations and, and with, with parents are dropping their kids off at your facility uh, and then picking them up two hours later. So, so fortunately for us, we have an attorney that's with us all the time, city attorney uh, from the city of Pasadena, so we can run that. But most of you don't have that luxury. And I actually have to pay an attorney every year. I think I spend about ten or fifteen thousand dollars paying a city attorney just to get my access. Okay, other, Cap? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious as to, uh, for each of you, well, obviously yours is pretty streamlined, but um, what are the key staff that you feel have to be in place in your organization? What, I mean, because there's different people with different levels of budgets and stuff, like how, how many, well, I, I have been here specifically, um, Julie, from you, but, how many staff, full time staff? Ten. Ten, okay, ten. ten. ten and then, one time. like, what are the key, since, you know, you wear a lot of different hats at the center I work at, I'm just wondering who, you know, what are the key people and the titles? There's one right there. Oh, She's the okay. head of production for okay. Pasadena Media. Okay. She not only manages all production uh, aspects of the station, but she also participates. So she hosts her own show, she produces her own show, she edits her own show, um, uh, and then she manages her own staff to get other programs done. Key, key position. Without her, the station would be functioning truly. And that Second, role is a production a manager. Uh, she is a head of production. Okay. Uh, and I, the production manager to me is a little bit different oh. structure. So she's the head of production. Okay. Uh, Aaron Wheeler is the head of. Uh, community. He's the one who goes out and gets the, the producers and, and the internships from high schools and other things. We deal with that community through Aaron, and he's also part of the training process. You know, we do a lot of training for all the programs that we talk about. Then the third component uh, is uh, our chief operations officer, uh, Chris Miller, who some of you may know, who's been around a long time uh, in public access television. Uh, he has one staff member that works with him, but he runs the stations technical aspect of all the studio facilities. He also acts as my number two and helps me with finance, legal matters, HR. So that's, that's how I see it. Okay, so you have the three key people and they have staff underneath it. Uh, correct. Okay. My answer is easy. It's all 2.5. <laughs> 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 like, uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't manage the program without, without our full-time uh, equipment channel coordinator. Um, does all the he he does all the, the scheduling for the public access channel but he like managing all that equipment I, I depend heavily on him to to make sure that everything is functional and well maintained and that um, and that um, the members that are using the resources are certified to use the resources and then I, I depend heavily on my membership services assistants um, to to make sure that the, the members are properly signed up, they're properly um, certified, and that they have the information to do the correct training, and um, and, and that gives me the, the freedom to focus on the production services that we have, and, and I can focus on I can focus on um, finding the freelancers and coordinating schedules and budgets and. And, and of that such. So, um, so my entire team, basically. So we're gonna, just real quick before we get to Stacey and um, Anthony the same thing, do you guys have like a, is somebody out of these key roles uh, responsible for the, like the marketing and promotion of your organization? It, it's within one of those roles that they, they're tasked with that. Okay, thanks. And then Stacey. 
similar, uh, my thing in my structure, I have my production manager is definitely uh, one of the most key people that I got because they handle not only our own executive productions but also the training of our, our member or our, our clients. Then I also have an outreach um, marketing and outreach manager that does all that side. And then the third component that's really important is my well, that's actually for my IT guy is also very important to make sure that our station and all our media platforms are working at its optimal level. We do everything in-house, our own website, our own app, uh, everything is done in-house. And the, the last part would be our client services manager so that um, anything that's going on within our facilities that's client-based, once they to enter it, into it, um, that person is in charge and dealing with some of the, the issues that, that may arise. Let me ask you, what's your annual budget? 1.6 uh, million. Does that cap the land into unrestricted? Yeah, exactly. yeah. And then I, again, I supplemented that. Is What's that? that? Cost? Yeah, well, my, my uh, operate my, I get my 160,000 capital, and I get 1.2 million in uh, pay fees or uh, cable subscriber fees. And then I supplement. Uh, Which is where you have your 70. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, then right. you, and then that goes to the city, to the municipality that you get, and then they give it to you. No, no, no. no. Yeah. It's, it's straight from the cable provider. Well, oh, that's, that's your franchise. franchise. Yes, right. And you get it all. Yeah. Wow. Percentage. Yeah. That's great. All right. Um, three rows back, the gentleman in the gray vest. Oh. No? All the way to the back in the middle. Well, my question is somewhat similar, but a little more specific about um, do any of you still do bulletin board slides and other positions <laughs> that you have? Um, who precisely does that? Because um, I'm probably one and a half. <laughs> Sad at my place, and I can't get anybody motivated to want to do that, and even the social media part of it. So, what position? So, when you're not in video programming, yes. you probably have carousel slides of some type. How do you manage that? Uh, I can go first. I, I so our equipment and channel coordinator is responsible for the slides of the carousel, but he often um, assigns that to an intern to create those slides for him. Um, and then um, the social media, our membership services assistant has taken on the responsibility of that, but again, she really kind of assigns um, the creation of, um, of, of photos and videos to post on social media um, to the interns. So, um, um, our chief operations officer does it on a regular basis. Um, we go through our programming and this carousel comes up at random times because programs come up with like, like regular programming. Uh, and then we modify and change it to accommodate the city and events within the city. It's not, not a really a huge job. Go ahead. So it's interesting because so our PUSD and our PTC channel, we really just distribute those. And so they you know they make all of their own programming, they set up their own slide. But between Chris and I, Chris will do the Aurora channel, which is the public access channel, he'll do all the slides for them and import all the um, files into our cable cast. I will do the government side, and so I will do the slides for the government side and schedule, you know, Chris will schedule Aurora, I will schedule K-Pass. Uh, we've made a lot of templates uh, for, you know, like the senior center or the um, health department, and we'll just kind of change uh, the text on that. But I will get our staff to case like, hey, you have some downtime, make me a couple slides, intern, Maybe some slides, let me adjust that in turn. <laughs> We're going to use PowerPoint but, or your Photoshop skills, but Stacey, that's what, about your, what about your carousel? Um, it's done on, to my IT, on my programmer, the IT department handles our, our carousel on, on, on our website. And we don't have a book. Yes, it's called bulletin board. Bulletin board and social media. Yeah, you know, but then I, my marketing guy, working with the IT guy, handles all of our social media platforms. We're on Instagram, Facebook. Um, all of them. The young millennials are unbelievable. You ask me, I don't know how they use any of that stuff. They, they do it all. I just, I just go, wow. I agree. Aside from Bobby and Chris, who we should describe how we do, we have a, a, a young woman on staff, she's a part time employee, and she takes care of our social media, media for us uh, Facebook, Twitter, and all of Well, relevant to some of the bulletin board things, um, we're replacing our system. We thought we were pretty efficient with our bulletin board system where uh, it's all template based and we give accounts out to all of our users and they can automate, you know, they can self-enter their, their thing. However, we learned that's one extra thing they have to do. So it was getting less and less used, so we 
replacing it. Um, and this has to do with that buying more efficient tools, tools that can uh, dynamically populate the bulletin boards, so less staff requirements. But the use of egg funds to buy more equipment to perhaps replace or reduce the reliance on staff. Um, so, I mean, everybody, I assume, is doing that. And, and you know, where do you ever feel like, yeah, I can't go that far in some areas uh, with the investment in peg dollars? You know, the restricted equipment facilities. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example? Well, the bulletin board is one. Um, you know, uh, we are actually, un we left unfilled a programming coordinator position because our automated system is perhaps a little easier to use and self program. The, the, the new system we're buying is even easier, it requires less staff. So, so, so we're not talking about robotic cameras like a, a commercial well, station is done. You know. yeah, there are the PTC cameras. I, I heard one of our cities in our county, they use two people to record a city council meeting. I mean, what the heck? That's so we, bad. We, we use all robotic cameras. That's not, that's not. Right, no, no, but beyond that, I mean, you can automate. Now there are cameras that can track people. There, it just goes on and on. You, can, you know, I've even heard of a self automated uh, meeting, meeting recording system. Well, I want to say that commercial television, you know, news operations yeah. have gone much more robotic, yeah. but that has not reduced staffing. Right. It has shifted something yes, from being a exactly. camera operator to being an IT coordinator yeah. specialist for the camera yeah. group. So there's a, a little bit of, uh, of, sh of shift. Have, have you seen a shift? Well, uh, I, I think, I think, question to you. I think it just makes the jobs easier. I think what's, what's happened is with technology, people have gotten just more efficient. I don't, I don't see that getting to the point where you're going to eliminate positions. But I think all of us have always been operating on shoestring budgets anyway. Yeah. We've always had minimum out there. So I think what's happening is we're using whatever funds we have to get more efficient. And then in, in the course of that, our staff will get more efficient. So I don't think it's going to eliminate them. I think it's going to make them a happier people. Because again, as, as others have said, most of my staff, when I hired them, they're passionate about this field. They're, they're, money's probably the third thing on the list for them. You know, it's about the industry, and it's about the work environment, and then, yeah, money will be important, but it's not the most important thing. So, my job has always been to try to figure out how to make it as efficient and easy for them to do their jobs at the optimal cost. Mm -hmm. I'll take issue with what you said a little bit. Um, from a network point, point, television network point. Uh, it wasn't to save money. Robotic camera, I mean, I was at NEB 30 years ago, and the heads of NBC said to me, we, you know, we want to you know, eliminate union operations, we're going to cut our costs in the union, we were owned by RCA, then owned by General Electric. It's, it's about money. Um, and I would argue that um, those efficiencies in the news programs, network news, NBC Night News, there's news programs that I know very well that have done. Uh, if you've got a camera operator, for example, that's making a uh, base salary of $60,000, $60,000 union salary, plus overtime, you have three camera operators on the news, that's a huge savings, annual savings. The, the network's continuing to look at that. So I, I don't think it's wrong for you or us to look at how efficient it would be. We, we, we do our, um, our city hall meeting every Monday night, all robotic cameras. I, I don't like them necessarily. Um, and I and I and I would argue that with all the new technology, I still see shows where the, the, the don't lose audio, announce announcer moves in and out. But that's me. You know, I, I, I get my production value out on it, it. Believe me, my colleagues who are the presidents and general managers of these stations and the money that they're saving, they'll live with it. So it, it, there is a lot of value in that. I'll say in Sacramento, the Metro 14 uh, it has all robotic cameras. Uh, they have an operator for robotics and switching. They have generally uh, audio if necessary, but um, they do it with two people, and they operate live out of five city council chambers and one board of supervisors chambers. So that all of that is automated in order to make that happen. And in the back row, uh, Sue? Yeah, I think that one of the beauties of having equipment that will do these sorts of things is that we can take the staff time that normally was going on those kinds of things and shift it over to getting out in the community more, engaging more people in the community. So I think there's, it's actually a luxury to be able to have less expensive, more efficient equipment that will allow us to do our job even better, do things we maybe didn't have time to do before or do as well as we would have liked to have done them before because now we have those resources that we can put into those or in those areas. So well, that's a good point. We, we're, we're fortunate with our pay funds since we're going to pay money. Mm -hmm. what, what the team has done is we, 
we bought some new high-end 4K cameras, beautiful cameras. Um, and then the cameras that we that we had in excess of, we had three or four, we then gave those down to the producers that are able to check them out. Mm -hmm. So the staff can use our cameras. So in, in that sense, yeah, it, it is better. So the community gets to use that yeah. kind of equipment, take it out in the community to their own productions. You're right. Good point. Okay. Oh, yeah, I want to ask you, Stacy. Um, you have, so you have your production um, director or manager doing the production side and the training side, and then so you kind of like your education and production departments are kind of melded. Yeah, well, for for us, I mean, it was simple. So when I got there, it was a, a, a real pain to be able to get three or four people on the same schedule to come into training, and that was a, that was hindering um, new people joining uh, our, our program. So what I did was I put everything online. It's not the, the greatest um, system, but it, it's a start. What happens is it allows people to get through the basics, you know, all the minimum qualifications that they need to, need to do to become a certified producer. And then when they spend their time going through that, then my production staff with, with his uh, production crew will actually enhance and, and work with them on an individual basis when they come into the facility. So I do a lot of screening online so that I don't waste my, my staff's time. But well, that's how integrated, and then client services kind of helps them through that process at the beginning, and then the handoff to the uh, production side. And then your I you have a separate marketing and outreach person. Um, are the skill sets they have to have to have a, a key role in your organization, uh, television side? Do they, can they kind of promo, write copy, that kind of thing? They, they, they all get cross screened about that because, again, uh, when I first had my marketing guy out there, Selling the world, it was like, hey man, he went back to the office, the production guy goes, oh my god, you just, you know, it's too tough what you do. So he had to learn the nuances about the production side. So that when he went out there, he started to uh, not oversell, and he actually did a great job in in um, uh, promising and delivering exactly what he was doing. We don't want to overpromise, right? Because people out there have all these great expectations. We're public access, and he had to learn that. But he's the guy that actually, besides me, I'm, I'm a lot of the face that goes out there. But then I. I hand it off to myself, so I, I mean, uh, you know, hit, hit the various people out there and then I'll hand it off to the staff and then they'll, they'll roll it through the system for us. And you have a, a dedicated IT person. Oh, yeah. And, uh, in the back, go ahead, Jeff. Um, so, Harmony, of the 2.5 positions you have, which one is the 0.5? The half-time? <laughs> <laughs> our, our membership services assistant. Okay. And then um, for all of you, are, including you, Gary, are all of you the HR department? <laughs> or do you consult with an HR? Who, who does uh, onboarding, uh, 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 interns, and stuff? I, 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 well, yeah, we're, we're an independent corporation now. So, yes, this is, this is, I'm the CEO of this corporation, a chief operations officer, uh, the net chief of the department. Uh, Bobby is the head of production, and Eric Wheeler, who just came into the building as the head of, uh, of community. But HR, uh, the, the, and, and uh, I think my, is Liza, yeah, right. she's out of administration. Uh, but when we get stuck, uh, we use HR uh, within the city of Pasadena. So when HR issues come up, then maybe are beyond our, our comprehension. And, and remember, I told you I had an attorney that, that counsels me. And, and I've done HR myself for a long, long time. That, so usually the most so who handles onboarding of people, uh, employee handbook, uh, signing up paperwork? Yeah. So your are an administrative person, um, yes. Lisa does that? Uh, she does part of it. We, we the staff, the examples. Uh, we just mm -hmm. finished last year the employee handbook and the board was to this, you know, a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we, and, then, and then we have it reviewed by our attorney and then we have the HR person of the city of Pasadena come look at it and see how effective. Stacy, mm -hmm. how do you go? I have, I have an HR supervisor slash manager who's who's um, main duties of that, and she's cross trained with our office manager to you know handle the invoices things like that. But her main primary duty first is HR. One of the seventeen. Yeah. Okay. And uh, small operation, but yeah. probably supported by LPCAP. Yeah, LPCAP has her own HR generalist. She does all the onboarding for anyone who's on payroll. Um, so that includes um, our, our 2.5 staff, but any of our seasonal staff that we have. Um, anyone who's a freelance, though, um, I, I just, they, they um, go directly through me. They don't need to go through each other. Freelancers are hourly employees, and they're onboarded the same way everybody else? No, different. They uh, basically, 
um, basically, um, they, they, um, what's that called? The W2? No, 1099. 1099. Yeah, independent contractor, and I just make sure we get those forms and, and then deal with our finance department and make sure they get paid. So, so no, no need to go through the same onboarding as our payroll staff. Okay. And for you, um, are you the HR then, person? Uh, so are you the HR person? For me? Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, I, I do all of our, our HR. We have an HR consultant, though, uh, for uh, uh, paperwork and phone call, uh, on call, uh, you know, unlimited. Uh, so uh, you know, they'll come out, they'll do the hands on, but uh, we have consulting services essentially. Uh, but we have you know, the employee handbook and the safety and training guide and the discrimination uh, training and uh, everybody from uh, our uh, full time permanent staff. Uh, down to the uh, minimum wage uh, uh, journalists, uh, young people who come through a grant program, all get out for it. Uh, there's just too much risk associated with not doing that. And it's, I probably spend 25, 30% of my time in HR. Uh, you know, we're, 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 very, we're very similar. We're very similar to Pasadena. We have 10 uh, full time benefited staff. Uh, we have uh, one uh, half-time person, and then, uh, but we also have about 40 people who are on call. Uh, paid staff who under a grant come in and operate our truck. So we're very similar to Pasadena. Uh, um, our operations budget is about uh, 750,000. Uh, we have to raise about 125,000 ourselves. The rest comes from franchise fees directly because uh, we're supported by uh, Sacramento overall has about $13 million in franchise fees, of which we see about 650000 The cities and counties keep about $10 million of that $13 million uh, for firemen, police officers, sewer and road repair. Uh, so none of that money stays with us. Uh, Stacy gets all of his money? No, not a percent, yeah. yeah. Well, oh, oh, okay, you get a uh, percent. And then the, uh, the, the, the state agency who oversees that has been, you know, they, to slide, they keep a small administrative fee on this is important for you because I just had this discussion with Mike. Um, our franchise fee perspective at at and is, you know, we might get a, a million and a half dollars. And the city was very um, careful a couple years ago to separate the two so that that franchise fee that they're getting goes into the general fund. Mm -hmm. They're correlated to, that's what I found it interesting for you, that the money goes directly to you, the money goes well, no, we, it goes to the Cable Commission, and we we barter with them all the time. Yeah, when the Cable Commission gives the money, where does the money go? It, well, it, we have three entities. We get the public money, uh, education, nonprofit gets the education money, and the government channels. So it, but it's coming directly. Oh, yeah, it comes as a directly so as a check. Yeah. But, but uh, what you were making reference to in California is the difference between yeah. franchise money and the peg did uh, so two, capital two, outlay two, money, which is restricted. So, and so, case, so we've done really well. The money goes Capital. from the city of Pasadena so that they can control it. And then they give me a lot of money through the general fund. Right. I, I would much prefer your arrangement or your arrangement. But well, and, and, and it's similar in that, in, in, but Sacramento County is a JPA, so they have five cities in the county, and all of the money comes to the Cable Commission, which appoints to that Joint Powers Authority of the Cable Commission. And then they split it from there. So you're dealing with the cable commission that is your city council, and they take off the council hat and they put on the cable commission hat, and, and they have that. that's what, yeah. And as it comes to pay funds, actually take money off the top of the pay funds too. Right, because for the government. 